Chief Justice, I want to get into um, the issue of violence against women and children. We're clearly not uh, doing en enough. And um, you are arguing that although imposing uh, firm sentences in cases involving gender-based violence um, is a major deterrent factor. You are arguing that it is not uh, the most, the most con uh, effective form of, of deterrence. It's one of the major deterrent factors, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Tell us why you are um, arguing like that, based, of course, you, 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 you told us the, um, the other week, this is based on international research. This is what research is telling us. I reiterate that it takes predictability in relation to detection, effective prosecution, and conviction when evidence is available to actually deter the crime. You can have death penalty, you can have life sentence, you can have whatever, harsh sentence as a possibility. But for as long as would be perpetrators know that your law enforcement machinery is so weak that they have got, say, an 80, 90% chance of getting away with it, then they are going to keep on taking their chances. But my colleagues say, and I believe them, that nobody wants to be arrested, nobody wants to be prosecuted. That's why they hide their faces when they appear in court. Now, when people know that the system is so efficient and effective that you are very likely to be caught, that they won't even go, they, won't, they will hardly ever try to commit the crime. That's where I'm coming from. Now, uh, interesting that uh, you said that, but also made uh, the comment or cautioned um, against using prosecutors using the conviction rate yes. as a yardstick to measure performance of uh, prosecutors. Yes. Well, maybe before I get to that, let me tie, tidy up that, that initial point. I also went on to say, by the way, <clears throat> what the criminal justice system deals with is symptoms. We're not addressing the root causes. And you will forever experience this problem as long as you don't deal with what is it that uh, breeds life to it. Interviewing one of the candidates uh, during the week, uh, a judge candidate, I said, in your experience, would you say that gender-based violence is rife where people are very poor, people feel neglected, their sense of dignity is rubbished by circumstances that prevail, or is it equal regardless of people's status of life or economic conditions? And her guess was as good as mine, she said most of the problem is where people are living in squalor conditions, where people are poor. So the root causes must be addressed so that as we combat the symptoms, we also try to eliminate it at a foundational level. Now, I said, of course, that, and the National Director of Public Prosecutions immediately agreed with me. You can't, as prosecutors, use the conviction rate as a yardstick for your performance. Prosecutors don't convict. So how do you connect their performance to finding a person guilty? Theirs is to bring an accused person in collaboration with the police to the court and prove their case and uh, leave it up to the magistrate or the judge to make the, to convict or not to convict. Uh, perhaps uh, not as a key performance indicator for prosecutors, but do you not think that uh, when people look at high conviction rates, they sort of get a sense that, um, you know, things are happening. In other words, those, the perpetrators are in fact being brought to book. I've got no problem with uh, a high conviction rate of people who are guilty. I'm just saying you can't use it as a yardstick for determining whether the prosecutors are doing their work or not. One, they are not the ones who investigate the cases. How does the, why is it not the yardstick for the police then? Because they are the ones who do the groundwork. I'm basically saying that we've got to look for effective ways of measuring our performance and apply those. You can't apply something that is not fundamentally your responsibility 
as a yardstick for determining whether you, you're doing your job well or not. You can't. It's inappropriate. What is international best practice? What do jurisdictions that do this better than us do? Well, uh, unfortunately, as a person who's not a prosecutor, I never checked what others are doing. It may well be that they are doing the same wrong thing. But I, 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 my approach to things is different, my brother. I'm saying, don't be overly obsessed with what others are doing. True, don't reinvent the wheel, but you've got to, you've got to be analytical in your approach. You've got to interrogate that yardstick that you are being given to rely on and say, but is it a true reflection of my of my, of my performance. I can give you an example, for instance, with judges. Even we can't use the conviction rate to test our own, uh, our own performance, although we are the ones who are convicting together with the magistrates. The real yardstick is, once a case has been given to you as a judge, how well do you manage it from the commencement of the trial up to the time when you deliver judgment? That is why when judges don't, perf or don't deliver their judgment, reserve judgments within certain time frames, they face consequences. Why? You are absolutely in control of this process. Why does it look like you are mismanaging it? But to say you've convicted so many people can't be a, a reliable, a credible yardstick for determining the performance of a judge or a magistrate. And, and how, Chief Justice, do we deal with this? social ills, which you're saying, um, uh, some of which are the root causes of what you are, as judges are at the receiving end of, I mean, three stabbings, you know, um, of school children within uh, one week. Well, it's, it's again back to the basics. My brother, when, when I grew up, and I sus suspect when you grew up, there was a very deliberate and intentional inculcation of a certain value system, Boto, Ubuntu. And there was a shared responsibility in our communities by the elders, by the parents, over any child, regardless of who gave birth to that child. But at some point, we abandoned that responsibility. We abandoned a very concerted effort in the inculcation of the value system that would yield this member of society who respects others, respects himself or herself, respects their property, etc., etc. Generosity escaped us. Sharing escaped us with our permission. And greed, which deadens your conscience to the point where you find it possible to kill another human being, set in. So I'm saying to deal with the root causes, quite apart from the economical, economic challenges, you have got to make sure that at every level, home ground, kindergarten, primary school, work, everywhere, faith-based organizations, there's a concerted effort to inculcate these values. The moral regeneration project must be taken to another level. It's been there, but the impact has, uh, has not been as significant as one would have thought it would be. So we need to wake, we need to respond positively to the shocking developments in our society and say, but what is it that we need to do differently for the affairs of our lives to change? Because we can't do things the way we have been doing them and expect a different outcome. We've missed something somewhere. We've disconnected uh, at the expense of repeating myself with a value system that would help us to to restrain ourselves under all circumstances. But is there, are there, say, aspects of our constitution or our laws generally that you think perhaps if they were to be relooked or refined could go some way towards dealing with these root causes of uh, the problems we're seeing? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I I'm not concerned about the regulatory framework. I'm not even concerned about policy or anything or plans. I'm concerned about implementation, my brother. What we need as a nation is the strengthening of all the weak institutions and the implementation of all the plans that we have in place and policies and 
competent supervision of whatever project we embark upon. That's what we need. We've got it all there. Some of these changes are really a luxury and add on to the fundamental framework we already have available. Implementation is our problem. Speaking of implementation, uh, I know a lot has been said, written about the costs of the state capture inquiry, for example. But uh, that's not my question um, to you this evening. But, uh, I mean, of course, you did raise the issue of, I mean, what are we comparing it um, uh, uh, against? But my question to you is about the assumed value uh, inherent you know, in setting up and conducting commissions of inquiry. And I'm saying this because um, we've had the Marigana inquiry, for example, but to date, not a single person has been held accountable for what happened there. Well, you see, <clears throat> it is when I address questions like this that people say I, I veer into the political space, when in my view it's actually a justice issue. I think it's a question best answered by those charged with a constitutional responsibility to set up commissions. But broadly speaking, you set up a commission of inquiry when there is absence of clarity in relation to who did what. And once you have uh, recommendations, you implement them. I would be very reluctant to deal with my reflections on whether they've been properly handled, appointed when it was really necessary or not. Because I think that may look like I'm criticizing other arms of the state. I would rather that, that question is directed to those charged with that responsibility of establishing commissions and doing something about the recommendations. Well, speaking of uh, the political, I mean, you've seen uh, what has been written um, by one or two people over the past week on the back of you releasing uh, that annual uh, report. And the question that some people are asking is whether you have any political ambitions. Well, let's rather deal with it uh, at, the, <clears throat> at the very center of it. What is it that I said is political and unacceptable for a judge to say? What is it? I, 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 I didn't say it, but uh, yes. there are people who are making an argument yes. that says that uh, perhaps uh, you, you would do better uh, by ignoring, yes. or the more you say out, uh, the more you say in public gives many people the impression that you're interested in political office. Okay. I'm going to ask you that question again because you seem to think there is some substance in it. But let me first begin this way. My brother, there is nothing I say, broadly speaking, in public that I'm not allowed to say in a judgment. I've said it and I repeat that our Constitution is a highly political document. The justice that people were fighting for, for us to be the constitutional democracy we are, is not only in the preamble of our constitution, but it, it is also one of the foundational values of our constitution. So when you have occasion to either write a judgment or to address people, and there is a link between what you say to justice or the constitution, there is no way in which you can say things that are clinically apolitical. Now, I get invited by a wide range of interest groups, business people, top, top business structures. They say, come and give us hope. You know, we, we think there is hopelessness here. This is the topic that we want you to address. And I go and address issues that relate to their sphere of operation with particular reference to the Constitution. So I ask again, what is it that is unacceptable for a judge to say that I have said? Two, some people raise the argument that you see, you've got to be wise enough to realize that when you make these kind of public statements, they may come back uh, before a court of law. What is it that a judge can say, whether it's in a lecture or in an address or a public speech that may not come back before court. Whether you're talking about murder or sexual or gender-based violence, it's likely to come before court. 
What is it that a judge is not, uh, is not allowed to say, by the way, other than vote for this political party, don't vote? For. What is it? What are people complaining about? Let's deal with it. You see, I mean, one reason I had to ask uh, this question, which is not, has nothing to do with me believing what uh, other people have written. You know, last week, uh, Chief Justice, the Judicial Services uh, Commission interviewed uh, Judge Hendricks right, um, for the position of deputy uh, judge president in the, in the Northwest. Now, he was asked about the fact that he had been an active member of the ANC in the, in the decade prior to being placed on, on, on the bench. Well, interestingly, the person who asked the question uh, was, in fact, ad Advocate Mbofu, who is a practicing um, lawyer, but also a chairperson of a political party. Yes. So these things that and these contradictions do swell as people um, have these conversations or conduct these interviews, as was the case um, in, in, this, in this instance. So, and precisely for the reason that South Africa is a very political country. Yes. But I think it is important um, to seek clarity yes. from people like you because uh, uh, opinions are formed yes. on the basis of uh, the little that gets said in public. Yes, But, but that has nothing to do with uh, people's beliefs in what gets said. Now we've got to deal with these things because people express opinions knowing that they are taken seriously in circumstances where they have not made an effort to inform themselves about things they are talking about. People with very limited or no knowledge at all about the judiciary and the responsibilities of a chief justice, whether the judicial conduct, code of conduct, bars or debars the chief justice and the judges from expressing their views on certain issues or not. They go on there and say, but this person is uh, pontificating, moving from one platform to another, expressing political views. Which political views? If you read, I was saying to one journalist, the article that was written some years ago by former Chief Justice Pius Langer, transformative constitutionalism. It's all politics. And you can't blame him. You know why? Because our constitution is a political animal. So people must, must not uh, move from the platform that assumes that out of ignorance and consumed by the desire for publicity or the suspected uh, ambition to be a, polit a politician, we move from platform to platform to speak. I'm a very responsible person, I would like to, to think. And the truth be told, I really don't, don't care about publicity. But when there is a need for me to address any issue, and I'm called upon to do so, I am going to. Tomorrow morning before I go to the Judicial Service Commission, I've been invited by the Enkhia Kerk, their top structure. Many of them will be there. They say to me, Chief Justice, come and address us. You know, we think we have faltered as a church in the past. Come and give it to us here and tell us going forward what responsibilities we can assume to contribute towards the rebuilding of this country that we love so much. Another person who thinks I don't know the limitations of my space of operations, there he is now galvanizing support for the undisclosed political ambition that he is harboring. I, I, I round up by saying, before you assume that we don't know what we are doing, we who operate this space and have been operating on it for over two decades, please find out and be sure that the information you have on the basis of which you speak authoritatively about what you think is wrongdoing on our part, that that information is reliable. Chief Justice, we've run out of time, but now that you've mentioned a church, um, I have to ask you this. What goes um, through the mind of a Chief Justice who happens to be a devout Christian um, when you are alone in the privacy of your home and uh, you're reflecting on such issues as the abuse of women by some church leaders, grass, petrol, snakes and all. I think it's a disgrace to the Christian faith for some of us to really commercialize the word of God, it is a shame 
for some of us to abuse our position of leadership, particularly in circumstances where people believe in your integrity. They are almost prepared to do anything you say they must do and abuse that and discredit the institution in pursuit of your own selfish desires. But I think the body of Christ, the church of God, must wake up from slumber and assume the critical role that they can play in helping to heal South Africa because we need healing. We've never allowed ourselves to be healed from the pain and the suffering brought upon us by colonialism and uh, racial discrimination and tribalism. Play their role. Let there be less focus on money rolling into a church. I'm not saying it is wrong, but uh, there, there is a lot of commercialization happening. There is a lot of abuse. Those people must be identified, spoken to, if they refuse to do the right thing in line with the word of God, they must be exposed for who they really are, to the public. Chief Justice, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, my brother. Thank you for Chief the Chief Justice.